Welcome everybody to today's Flexible Working Ambassador School live session with Hannah. This is the last of the live events that we're doing this year and I think that we're ending on a high with Hannah. Um, you know, Hannah is one of the co-founders of Diverse Educators. She's one of the founders of Women Ed. She does incredible work around diversity, equality and inclusion. And I think when we're thinking about flexible working and advocacy, we're really thinking about how flexible working can help everybody in our um, schools. Um, you know, matter what their circumstances are and thinking about how can we use flexible working to really drive that equality piece, you know, as well as promoting diversity in our schools and making sure that everybody feels completely included in what we do. So I know that this is going to be a slightly more practical session, isn't it, Hannah, for people to think, you know, through um, what they, you know, how to advocate for flexible working. So, you know, this is part of the, you know, Department for Education's Flexible Working Initiative. You know, they're totally on board and it's brilliant to have you with us today, Hannah. I know that everybody's in for a complete treat. So I will hand over over and leave it in your very, very capable hands. Thank you very much. And you do need paper and pen. I'm, I am going to be asking every couple of slides to jot down some notes, my dear, some commitments. So if you haven't got paper and pen in front of you, please do grab something that you can um, write on. So really thinking about flexible working um, through the lens of other identities is what today's session is thinking about and making that link to the inclusive cultures of our workplaces. So if you are on social media, please do um, follow us on Twitter. Please do check out our website. I've got some signposting at the end of the session to show you some of the free resources we've got on our website um, as well. So the kind of the brief this afternoon is, the, is focusing on the people who do the approving. So how can we um, advocate for the approvers and how can the approvers advocate for flexible working? Thinking about people who are on the senior leadership team, the trust leadership team, the governing body, the trust board, and thinking about those kind of those gatekeepers really, the people who are in the positions to really influence the culture of the organisation. And with that, consideration in mind of the fact that um, when we advocate for flexibility we are ultimately promoting diversity and leadership and making that link between diversity equity inclusion and flexibility sometimes flexible working is seen as a separate part as HR but actually this is, this is part of our DEI work and I want us to join that up um, and one of the things that we want us to think about at the end of the session is what training do the approvers actually need what, what training do the line managers and the middle leaders need to understand flexible working so that they can advocate for it? So think about the different kind of positions down the hierarchy and what training different groups need. Anyone who's heard me talk before um, will know that I love Simon Sinek and I, I use the golden circle regularly to help me articulate and communicate key messages. I'd encourage all of you to think about your golden circle for flexible working. What is your why for being here right now? What is your why for flexing the workforce in your particular part of the system? How are you then enabling, activating that flexible working? And then what's the outcome or what's the impact of that? And when I was um, head teacher of a startup school, I had golden circles of different stakeholder groups, different conversations. This really helped to zoom in on where we're at, why we're doing this, and what are the things we're going to be doing. So you might want to begin to build that kind of like triple, triple lens through the different sessions you've attended. I come to this work as somebody who hasn't worked flexibly, but I was a head teacher who enabled a very flexible workforce in a startup secondary school, a startup primary school. And it got me really interested in flexible working. As the co-founder of Women Ed and the founder of Diverse Ed, flexible working comes up a lot, as Antonia said. So when I was doing my MA in education, I, I deferred it during lockdown, I now need to finish it. I was looking at flexible working during COVID, during lockdown, as my MA in education focus. And these were some of the questions I was thinking about. Thinking about flexible working and its relationship to recruitment, which is not always a focal point. Quite often it's the second question. We connect flexible working with retention. We use it to keep people who are already employed as opposed to using it to recruit people. And I do a lot of work with ITTE providers around the country. And I say to them, like, if we've got staff who want to work flexibly and teach flexibly, we need to train them flexibly. If we ask them to train full time for a couple of years, that might actually put them off from actually applying to the system in the first place. So making sure that we're flexing all those different spaces. The third question is around re-engagement or returnship, which is behind the US lingo. So a couple of years ago, the DfE did a return to teaching project, um, but it, it, we were running it for our secondary school in Oxfordshire, for our county, but we had quite low um, uptake. 
We've got 250,000 qualified teachers in the country not working in our schools. How can we re-engage them? And particularly, they've had a big chunk of time off because they've had children or they've been ill or they've had a career change or they've been traveling. How can we re-engage those people who are qualified as opposed to focusing on those people who are being trained? And in the States, they've got massive returnship programs for different sectors where they give people um, placements and shadowing opportunities and coaching and mentoring to get them back into the sector that they left. So have a think about that as one of the three R's when it comes to people management. We're going to think about number four and number five more so um, in this session. So thinking about mindsets, attitudes and perspectives, I think is really important. We need to change a lot of mindsets and a lot of perspectives when it comes to flexible working. I do think that the lockdown pandemic has helped in some ways, but also it's been a bit of a poor proxy for flexible working. Um, so we need to consider that as well. And the final question around culture and ethos. Ultimately, our focus here is about inclusion by design, creating inclusive workplaces and really thinking about what we are consciously doing to include people as part of our whole school, whole map, whole locality, culture and ethos. So there are five of the questions I want you to think about. And then my lines of inquiry through my MA research were things I've picked up over the last seven, eight years doing this work, listening in. I coach a lot of female leaders. I run a lot of training for leaders across the school system. These are some of the lines of inquiry, some of the hunches that I am unpacking. Why, in my opinion, is flexible working more common in primary and secondary schools? Why is it that we think that the younger children can, can have flexible working um, adults in their building, but in secondary schools we can't? Is there a mindset thing there? If we think about the fact that there's more men in, in secondary schools, is there a gendered men's there as well? How can we look at flexible working being as common for the non-leaders as for the leaders? Emma, Sh Emma um, Turner wrote a book about this, about it wasn't until she was a deputy head or a head that she could truly work flexibly because she had the entitlement and the privilege and the position to get the contract she wanted, wanted. I can see some nods here. I, I usualized when I was deputy head that we had co-leaders at middle leadership level. I had co-heads of English because they both had different skills. If we can usualize lead, um, flexibility lower down the ladder, it then becomes more usualized as we move up the ladder. Flexible working is quite often associated with those who identify as being a woman and with those who identify as being parents and carers. How can we make sure that flexible working isn't gendered and isn't exclusively for people with children, whatever capacity they've, they've got those children in? There'll be other people within the building with other commitments, other responsibilities, other interests they want to pursue. It's absolutely okay if someone wants to work flexibly because they want to do a PhD or because they're an artist in their free time. It shouldn't just be for women and just be for people um, who have got um, parental responsibilities. I've mentioned the, the fifth one already, the flexible working is more often used as a retention tool than a recruitment tool. The TES did some research a couple of years ago, I remember listening to the head of um, recruitment at a, at a conference for head teachers in Oxfordshire, where he said they'd done a study, and just by mentioning flexible working in an advert, you got something like 76% more people applying for the job, just by showing that you would consider a flexible application. So the retention of, of flexible, um, being open to it and talking about it to the recruitment process is really, really important. And then the final one's interesting. From the people who I have talked to thus far, the different ways we work flexibly seem to have different commonalities. So part-time work seems to be more common practice than job share work. So when we think about the different categories of flexible working, that's a consideration as well. So thinking about the fact that I was secondary for most of my career, but then worked in primary, Job shares worked really well in primary. Say, for example, you had a year two teacher and it was two people tag teaming in for that year two class. Whereas in secondary schools, you might have more part-time teachers and you only timetable their lessons on the day they're in because the timetable works differently in a secondary school. So there's an interesting thing there to look at as well about the different ways we enable flexible working in different um, phases within the school system. One of the, this is what I just put together with my thoughts of the kind of the golden circle or the ripple effect around um, flexible working. My why for flexible working is about retaining, recruiting and re-engaging the highest caliber um, employees we can to come into the sector and to stay in the sector. And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't do this flexibly because we actually lose a lot of fantastic practitioners.
the how, the blue circle, is thinking about the operational practices, policies and processes we need to then have to enable that to happen. Thinking about our HR policies. I'd love it if some people in the call today were from HR roles. I think they have a massive sphere of influence to think about how we do talent management, people management, the culture and ethos of the organisations where we're working, but also the role modelling, the visible role modelling of, of leadership behaviours and attitudes. So that's that blue circle around the how. And then the impact on the what is the kind of the the way we do things and how we disrupt and dismantle some of those operational systems and structures. And I'm particularly interested in timetabling. There's a great organization called EdVal, um, and they offered to do a free conference for Women Ed several years ago now, because when we think about who is the timetabler in a lot of schools, and as I say, I was secondary for a long time. I'm sorry if anyone on the call is a man who teaches math, but quite often the timetabler in a secondary school is a male maths teacher. And they come to the timetable with a very logical brain um, and it's very tidy and it's very organised. And research shows that if we had more women trained as timetablers, we could disrupt the timetabling in our schools more, particularly in secondary schools where there are more perceived barriers. So that's just some of the things I want us to think about. Um, and that visibility on the right hand side there on the what but the more we usualize flexible working, the more common it becomes, the more usual it becomes, the more the, the less eyebrows get raised when you actually do it. So I feel like we're in a bit of a, 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 a change, a tide change at the moment, that we've got a real opportunity to make this part of common practice when it comes to our sector. I think when I was reading the TimeWise report, is it 27% of workers in other sectors work flexibly, but only 17% work flexibly in the education system? So we are quite traditional compared to a lot of the other professions. So I'm going to ask you to pause at this point and gather your thoughts and, and make some notes. Your first set of notes. You've got your why and a how and a what question here. Why do you personally, professionally want to flex your workforce? OK, what's your why for being here? What's your why for your role, your school? How are you or how might you create more flexible working opportunities within your own context? And what might the benefit be to your school of recruiting and retaining staff on flexible um, contracts? Let me just give you a couple of minutes to gather your thoughts and make some notes on those three questions, please. I'm going to invite a couple of you to unmute so I can actually hear some voices. So would anyone like to share their note for the why question? Why, why do you want to flex your, your team, flex your workforce? Does anyone who'd like to share? I'm happy to share first. Thanks, Deborah. Go for it. Um, so we have um, kind of introduced flexible working at, at my school. Um, and it has largely been on a reactionary basis um, as opposed to, to planned, but that, that's okay, I think. Um, so the why is um, that we wanted to, well, I wanted to retain excellent practitioners. Um, during COVID, particularly that they particularly come from a creative kind of acting field. And during COVID, they found it difficult to, to get any um, acting roles. But now that they're coming out of COVID, the opportunities are coming up more frequently. Um, but I don't want to lose them because they've developed some excellent skills um, of working mm. with students. Um, so how 
Um, I've provided opportunities for part-time positions. Um, there's kind of a team teach um, role going on. Um, so they kind of the kind of the co-teaching model that you, you were the co-leading model you were talking about. And what are the benefits? Well, they're developing skills during their other pursuits um, that they're able to bring into practice when they're here with us. Um, they've got more energy um, and more positivity on the days that they're with us. Um, and I don't want to say it, but there's 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 less absence. <laughs> interesting. That's really interesting, that last one, isn't it? But yeah. I love that as a kind of a model for bringing um, vocational professional practitioners into the school, but actually that serves everybody, doesn't it? That they get to pursue their passion, but also have some secure income from you, but also bring that career knowledge, working career knowledge into the building. Are you second day of primary, Deborah? Uh, special. Special, but, really, yeah. really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Love that. Thank you very much for sharing. I'm gonna move on and ask someone to share our next time we pause. So um, I love um, the Centre for Creative Leadership. I use a lot of their um, infographics when I'm running leadership training. And they've distilled this piece of research into the three core benefits for flexible working in your workplace. And the, the first one speaks to, to some of the things that were shared there, that increased productivity. When we flex our workforce, we increase the diversity of perspective and, and identity within the space. And it enhances performance and it enhances productivity. So I think that's a really interesting one to think about. Some people might perceive it as you'll get less out of somebody. Um, your, people will be less productive, less committed, but actually it's the converse to that. The second one is that we create that loyalty within our team, that if we enable people to work flexibly, they, they pay us back in kind in their loyalty to the organisation because they, they've invested and they know you're invested in them. And that in turn um, improves the engagement levels of, of the team. I've worked with flexible workers in every school I think I've worked at, and there's never been issues with deadlines, with contribution. If anything, they go above and beyond, um, and you get two brains for the price of one a lot of the time when, when you've got a co-role. A, a co um, so it's a, I always see it as being a win-win. I'm a, very much a kind of abundance mindset person rather than a deficit mindset person, but there's lots and lots of positives. And I think perhaps we need to amplify the positive narrative more than the negative narratives that we hear out there so often about education. So I come to this work, as Antonia said, with the lens of, of, of looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when we started Women Ed six, seven years ago, I was very sort of like centered around the kind of the feminist agenda, the women leadership experience in education. But what surfaced quite quickly was that we weren't considering the intersectionality of those women, that we weren't thinking about what's your experience being a woman of faith, a woman of color, a woman with a disability, or a woman who's got multiple identities. So thinking about how we come to this work through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, I think is a, is a link we really need to make explicit. So diversity being the kind of the, the um, differences, the individuals, the richness of the diversity of experience and identities who are actually part of that team and seeing the benefits of that. Equity being us removing, identifying removing potential barriers. We do equity really well for the children in our care. I don't think we do equity as well when it comes to the staff. And I choose to talk about equity over equality because actually equality sometimes we just move the gaps up the system rather than actually closing the gap for the adults. So how can we create more equitable opportunities for the staff? And then the most important one for me is the inclusion. Not inclusion about the work the Zenco does, but the inclusion of the whole workplace, the whole organisation, the power dynamics, the interactions, the behaviours, how we co-create and cooperate. That to me is really important. And quite often people focus on the diversity. We need to diversify our curriculum, we need to diversify our staff, we need to diversify our governing body. But actually it's the inclusion that enables people to flourish and thrive and actually keeps people within that team. So thinking about that triangulation of those three ideas and how flexible working actually activates and enables and empowers some of these things to actually happen. I don't think people always think about that link. So we, look, we do our work looking through the lens of the Equality Act 2010. So that piece of legislation protects people from prejudice, discrimination, marginalisation, exclusion, etc. And there are nine identities, nine protected characteristics. And I want us to think beyond just sex, just gender when it comes to flexible working, and think about the impact that flexible working would actually have on the different demographic groups. 
So how might flexible working support somebody with a visible or hidden disability? And disability in our society, one in five people, one in five people in the UK have a disability. And that disability could include long COVID. It could include mental ill health. It could include um, a, a long-term terminal condition. So how might flexible working actually provide um, some space, some resource for, for people to show up and be teachers and work in our schools, but not have to do it in a full-time capacity? Age is another interesting one. We are an aging profession. Um, I hate to remind everyone that we have to stay in our roles until we're 65 to draw our pension. I can't, I can't imagine still being 65 and working full time in a school. I, I found it hard when I was 43. Um, so thinking about how actually um, flexible roles enable people to further their careers, but to do it at their own pace and perhaps get that balance as they get older and retain some of those really high caliber, high quality, experienced expert teachers in the system um, on their terms. I think that's something to think about, particularly in those shortage subjects. And we know it's really hard to recruit in particular subjects. Religion and belief is another interesting one, thinking about um, different faith systems and different significant days of the week and holidays. Um, how might flexible working actually enable um, people to do both, like be, be work, work in a school environment, but also follow their faith at the same time. So I know a lot of schools now um, potentially do a four and a half day week and finish early on a Friday. And people can then perhaps um, do other things on that Friday afternoon, including um, going visiting their, 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 um, their place of worship. So there's just a couple of things here to think about how actually flexible working enables different identity groups to actually be part of the, of the workforce. And intersectionality, is something just to really emphasize at this point, about the individuals who have multiple protected characteristics. Because those multiple characteristics ultimately can create double, triple, quadruple disadvantage. To so say, for example, you are a woman of colour, a woman of colour who's also a woman of faith, and you've also got children, you've got two or three or four barriers potentially you work through to be able to um, be seen at work, be visible at work, to be recruited, to be um, promoted at work. And I think the intersectional lens is really, really important as well. So I'm going to ask you to think about your data later on in the session, but looking at who's applying for flexible working and what identity group they, they, they sit in, what the identities they hold, um, who's, who's leaving the school and what identities they hold. And there's some interesting trends we're not really drilling down into in the data. And there could be some, that could be an interesting exploration to see if there's some patterns there for you to, to unpack within your institution. So your second question, I want you to make some notes on, how does your flexible working, that would make sense, sorry, how does your flexible working policy contribute to your DEI strategy and or approach? If you're doing work around DEI, how does this link? Well, if you're not yet doing work around DEI, think about um, your equalities policy, think about whether you've got um, a statement on your website about your commitment to DEI, or how might you build a bridge between your flexible working commitment and your DEI commitment? I'll see you a few minutes to think about that and to jot down some notes, joining up the dots between those different policies and commitments. Is there somebody who'd like to unmute and to share their thoughts on this? 
Maybe. with radio silence. I'm happy to give it a go, Heather. Uh, Thank you, Mike. Nice to have you here. <laughs> okay. uh, it, it is quite a difficult one because you, you'd want to believe that that's part and parcel of what you would do. You, you, would, you would assume and you'd expect it to be equitable for everybody. Um, and I guess in some practices, though, that might not be the case. And that's why this question is posed. Um, when, when, when I had my sort of the coaching sessions um, on festival working, the one, the one word that came up all the time was fair. Um, I think it's been very, very clear about what fair means to everybody. That this is it, it, when you when you put your policy in place for your flexible working, it has to be fair um, as an opportunity for everybody. But the outcome might not be the same for everybody, um, and that's what we're working on at the moment is is making that very clear with, with staff that um, the process is fair and equitable for everyone to buy from it, and making sure that people making the decisions are, are having those discussions around what's right for the school, the children, and that member of staff. But the outcomes might not always be equitable because you can't always have the same person requesting the same time off every day of the week. That's not gonna be the case, but it doesn't mean it's not fair. So yeah. we will approach, and I'll be honest, we haven't really linked it to our DEI work. We are doing some DEI, DEI, DEI work at the moment, but it hasn't naturally dovetailed in yet. But I see it very much doing that alongside. Um, and I, yeah, I think as long as, your, you. as long as your practice is right with the DEI and your beliefs are right and your, your fundamental beliefs are right with that, you will be equitable for everybody because that's what you're passionate about as a school. That's probably why we're all here. Brilliant, thank you. So just two things I want to pick up on that. I'll start with the second one, that actually when I, when I start working with schools around their DEI strategy, their DEI approaches, quite often they're doing more DEI work already that they don't even know they're doing because they don't see flexible working as being part of their DEI work, for example. So actually part of that information gathering and almost like collating it all on a whiteboard somewhere or post it, how do you, you work with your teams and think about all those different jigsaw pieces that actually are part of our cultural commitment to DEI in our school, that might actually start you off with your DEI commitment because you are doing things um, already. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, this word fair is really interesting because everyone's got a different interpretation or perspective of what it is to be fair. And I had exactly the same conversation. So we were a startup school, really small team. I had loads of flexible workers and they all wanted Friday off. I could have opened the school if they all didn't come in on a Friday. So I had to do a bartering system each year where, yes, they could all work flexibly, but they had to be flexible about how they work flexibly. And we had to have an open conversation every year. And I, created, I had a number of SLT who were um, 0.6 and 0.8. So we had a very democratic, this year you're going to choose first, next year you're going to choose first, the year after you're going to choose first. And we had a really open, transparent conversation about the impact on the school if everyone had a Friday off. So I think, I think that flexibility needs to work both ways I think sometimes it, it, it's, a, it's a request and actually not actually being modeled on the person and requesting it. it's an interesting tension to navigate um, as well so thank you Mike for sharing your thoughts there so we at Diverse Educators we, we, we come to this work through that holistic intersectional whole person kind of lens um, and we use the language of be where you are celebrated and not tolerated um, to speak directly to the British values, which really jar me. I don't think we should be teaching anyone to tolerate any, anybody else. Um, obviously, the British values are quite people-facing, but if we think about which staff in the sector, in the system, feel tolerated rather than celebrated, is the flexible working a bit of a dirty secret in our schools, or is it really visible? Is it really amplified? Is it really clear on our websites that this is part, say, part, part of what we're doing as part of our cultural pledge? I think sometimes we perhaps don't amplify the things that people are looking for when they're looking on our websites. So have you got somewhere on your school website that you are advocating for flexible working so that when prospective people looking at your school, um, doing a bit of sort of background research, they can see that this is part of your commitment, part of your culture and your ethos. And we can't really talk about diversity, equity, inclusion without thinking about belonging as well. I stole this Venn diagram from um, Chris Burnett on LinkedIn, who is the um, EDI leader at Adidas. Um, and lots of people in other sectors talk about DEI through the lens of belonging. How are we creating belonging for different individuals, different groups, different stakeholders within our school, within our school system? Because if we really do this work in a meaningful way, if we create inclusive workplaces with inclusive policies and practices, 
the levels of belonging go up and people feel more invested in and they then in turn invest more in the actual um, in, in employment they're doing as well. So thinking about the link between diversity, inclusion and belonging, I think is really, really vital. And belonging underpins our well-being, our sense of satisfaction, work, workplace satisfaction. So how might this work feed into those levels of belonging um, within, our, within our workforce as well? And I always take it back to Mathis hierarchy. We, we all met Mathis hierarchy when we trained to teach. And we think about Mathis hierarchy um, through the lens of the pupils and the students we serve. But actually thinking about those levels of belonging, Mathis hierarchy for the adults is another consideration. Thinking about how you can't move up the, the pyramid beyond the middle tier to self-esteem and self-actualization if we haven't got that belonging tier really, really addressed. So actually, are there barriers that we are we are inadvertently creating for adults in the school system, in the sector, in our buildings, that's perhaps prohibiting them from fully leaning in and fully committing and, and sort of like moving up the ladder or taking on responsibility because they're stuck in that middle section. Just some things to think about there, about that cultural and ethos pledge within our wider school environments. And I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, but two of the provocations I always give to people when I'm, when I'm doing training, and I've just tweaked them slightly here around flexible working. Are we intentionally including? Because if we're not intentionally including, we are unintentionally excluding. So are we doing inclusion by design? Is it intentional inclusion that we are doing for our workforce? So who are you intentionally including when you are supporting flexible working? And who are you unintentionally excluding when you don't offer flexible working? None of us want to exclude anybody within our school cultures, our school context. But I do think it's an interesting one to check ourselves um, on, that actually this is how it's received. There'll be a perception there from different individuals and groups that there is an intention if we aren't doing something as well as if we are doing something. So your next question for you to reflect on and to make some notes on, Thinking about the Equalities Act and those different identity groups, different type of characteristics, and thinking about your staff, which groups of staff could potentially have a higher sense of belonging if they could work flexibly in your school or in the wider school system? Are there particular identity groups, particular individuals, you don't need to name names here, but just think about them demographically, are there particular groups of staff that actually this might make a big difference for if we created more flexible working opportunities? Give you a moment or two to think about that. I would like to follow Deborah and Mike's lead here and unmute and share, share the reflections. I'm happy to go again. <laughs> go for it, Deborah. Go for it. As there's a silence there. <laughs> there are two of us in the room, so maybe that's why there's so much thought going on here. <laughs> I was really thinking about it because we have quite a lot of staff who are um, accessing flexible working and we're all white women. That's an interesting observation, Deborah, isn't it? Yeah, really, really interesting. I mean, there's no exclusion um, by role. There's a whole mixture no. within the school. Um, it's not for, well, some is for childcare reasons, but not all. Um, but I found that really interesting. And we have a really diverse staff as well. Mm. Um, and lots of men. <laughs> so I don't quite know. Um, yeah. That's so really interesting. Really interesting. The whole, the whole men working flexibly um, 
lens, I think it's an interesting one for us to think about. So in the Lean In um, and McKenzie Women in the Workplace report, which they published every November, um, and I've been reading it for like the last 10 years, it's really interesting to, to track kind of the trends in workplace culture. There's research that shows that when men apply for and get flexible working, it completely changes the culture for the women as well because it usualizes that flexible working is okay in this organization. So by getting a couple of men, and I ran an event um, two summers ago, which Antonio actually spoke about, and I kept tweeting out, I need some men who work flexibly to come and talk at this event. We need to show that men can work flexibly too. And I found three, and I've got quite a big Twitter network. Um, and it was really interesting hearing why they all work flexibly. They were all dads, but primarily they all worked flexibly because they were also consultants and had their own training businesses. So my oldest assistant head teacher worked 0.8 for me and, and didn't work Fridays because on Fridays he trained. Um, one of them was a computing teacher. He worked three days a week in a secondary school and two days a week he contracts doing computing. Probably completely buffered his salary that way. Um, and the third person was a deputy head in a primary school who um, does, he writes books around mindfulness and does quite a lot of positive education kind of like training. So it was just interesting seeing their reason for doing it. Um, so I, I think that's something for us to think about. I think it's a really great reflection there that you perhaps haven't ever looked at who's working flexibly and looked at the kind of the breakdown um, by, by all those protected characteristics as well as by role. Is there anybody else who wants to just chip in listening to what Deborah shared there, who's got a different perspective or a different reflection? Do you think it's something in the chat? Yeah, love that, Antonia, thank you. There's a parliamentary paper that supports what I just said. I'm gonna call on you, Heidi. What are you reflecting on? You put this kind of like thinking finger on your cheek. What, what, what are you reflecting on? Oh, I can't hear you. Are you, are you muted? It's a bit difficult at the moment because we haven't implemented flexible working. Okay. We we so, do we do do it as we go along. We have been doing it to some extent. We realise that, but we haven't actually made anything official. We haven't got a policy. It's not on a website. Um, it's not on our recruitment adverts yet. So um, we're still in early stages because we've had other things to concentrate on. So I'm sort of feeling a little bit. Um, you know, like I can't contribute that much, really. That's fine. And thank you for me putting you on the spot there. I guess there's a couple of things to, to take away then, like mm. anticipating who might want to work flexibly and that you, and you might have a hunch or idea that will be particular groups. But I also think about when you position it and you introduce it and you make that commitment quite public, how can you make sure that it is positioned in a way that this isn't for the working mums in the building? I think making it really, really explicit that like, I had lots of people um, who wanted to do um, PhDs, for example, um, and they could have left teaching and done a full-time PhD, or they could work part-time and do a PhD alongside it. And that mm -hmm. would be male, male or female. So I guess that might be something to think about, the kind of the communication of it, so that you're almost mitigating or, or redressing some of the biases out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thinking about the data, I think it's really interesting. And, and, and Deborah has done some reflection there just on the data she knows, but really tracking like who's applying for flexible working, who's getting it, who's being denied it, and who's leaving. Because looking at that data, around 250,000 people leaving the sector, predominantly women, predominantly women between the age of 30 and 39, and predominantly because they're parents and carers, I think that's a tragedy. I think that we should be really embarrassed as a sector that we're not doing better to retain them. If I gave you a parallel um, around like data analysis, when I left Headship, I spent a year running a PPCE for a big university. And I had 450 training teachers. And I had this list of like 18 people who had dropped off the year before and deferred, and I had to re-engage them. And as soon as I saw that list of 18 people, I began asking questions and straight away, the thing they had in common was that every single one of them had at least one protected characteristic, at least one. And that made me give a bit of challenge back to the university that actually, how are we making sure that we are looking after different groups of people? And how are we thinking about who is potentially vulnerable from disengaging or, or not passing the course? So I think sometimes we look at the data of who's doing the effects work in the building, but actually are we looking at the different touch points 
And are we thinking about who we're potentially not recruiting because they're asking for flexible working or who we're potentially losing as well? Could be an interesting story beginning to emerge there about the data. I use this um, stimulus um, just to get people to think about the ideas of, um, of, of power and privilege within the system as well. Because ultimately, there's power and privilege at play with flexible working because someone has the power to say yes or no. Someone is the gatekeeper, whether it's the governing body or the CEO or the head teacher, there's a hierarchy at play. But when we're talking about DEI in any context, power and privilege is absolutely hard baked into those conversations. And this wheel is called the Wheel of Power and Privilege. It is from the US, so it's slightly out of kilter with our Equality Act. And you can see the descriptions around the outside aren't quite the protected characteristics. But the idea is that, it's, that power isn't binary. It isn't that you've got power and privilege and I haven't got power and privilege. We all have power and privilege in different ways based on different identities we hold, based on different spaces we sit in. So if we think about some different public figures, if we think about, I don't like to think about Boris Johnson, if we think about Boris Johnson for a second, um, he would sit quite centrally in this diagram because in multiple ways he has power and privilege as a heterosexual, heterosexual cisgender, white, educated, able-bodied man. So in multiple ways, he has power and privilege, but he doesn't need to perhaps think about some of the things that the people in the outer circles need to consider. There's a value system at play here that society has created that we perpetuate, and this is very Eurocentric, that, we, that different people are made to feel differently and different people are marginalised by society and marginalised by the system. So what I'd ask you all to think about is when we're thinking about our flexible working um, processes, policies, approaches and advocates, how can we make sure we are disrupting some of the, some of the power and some of the privilege that's at play? Because if we've got a group of white, straight, male head teachers deciding the fate of the middle leaders and the teachers and whether or not they can work flexibly or not, that could be slightly problematic. So thinking about have we got a diverse group of stakeholders actually reviewing um, the applications of flexible working? Have we got diverse perspectives looking at the business case and the pros and cons of it? It's just something else to think about. Um, I can see Deborah and her colleague are having a good chat about this. Let me just give you all a moment just to read around the diagram and feel free to unmute and share any thoughts about this diagram and, and what you're processing. Oh, it's, it's a great comment in the chat there. Thank you. So as a middle leader, you're on the receiving end of the flexible working, but it does make you feel valued and cared for. Brilliant. And because you've received it and you've experienced it as and when you move up the ladder, it will mean that you will make sure those opportunities also happen um, for other people um, as well. So that's great, a great testimony there. Thank you. Does anyone want to share any thoughts on, on this diagram? What are we reflecting on or discussing or processing? I think it's the born teacher in me. I can't sit. Leave you sitting there. That's fine. Thank you. Leave me hanging, Deborah. Thank you. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I find it absolutely fascinating. I could look at it all day. Um, and as society, you, you, you feel like you've moved on so far. Um, but yeah, we've still got a long way to go, haven't we? Mm. And I, I think, think it's an interesting link back, isn't it, to... I'm not saying this is the case in your school, but if you think about in the wider sector, um, I, I say this actually quite often to ITT providers, that a lot of the women who have left the school sector because they can't work flexibly have gone to run ITT or teaching schools. And if we think about the demographic of who runs 
teaching training units around the country, they, they are mainly women who look like me, women in their late 30s, early 40s, um, and quite often they, they, they have children. And then they are the ones recruiting and training the next generation of teachers. And we then begin to perpetuate perhaps the fact that we haven't got diverse role models. And when I had 450 training teachers, every single one of my tutors and mentors who I inherited were white, but I had a number of diverse trainees. So the same for us to think about here, how we can disrupt that we, none of us in the call would want flexible working to be the domain and the privilege and the entitlement of white women in the education sector. How can we make sure that there is a diverse approach that enables flexible working for different identity groups, whether we're talking about gender or race or any of the other protected characteristics? I think it's something that perhaps we need to really sort of like sit with and think about and discuss at length with our own respective um, leadership teams. Um, to make sure we are being truly inclusive um, and, and not selectively inclusive, which might not be deliberate, but that might be how it's being um, perceived. I've got a few notes in the chat here. Um, and Marcus, you change, you've changed the vice, no worries, you missed the question. We're looking at the um, provocation on the screen, Marcus, here, of power and privilege. We're just thinking about the relationship between this diagram and the gatekeeping, um, the kind of who's, who's got the power to decide who, who gets flexible working. Mark's put in the chat, those of power need to act differently to help those who are marginalized in society to be included and belong. You won't think twice about it. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Like, we are so focused on inclusion and equity for the children. I don't think we're always as focused when it comes to the staff. And I, I don't think we can say we're doing DEI in our workplace if we're not thinking about all of those different stakeholder groups. So that's a really good comment there, Mark. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Antonia. You put up there as well. Perfect. So to bear that in mind as, as, as we kind of carry on, um, because whenever I'm doing DEI training in any, in any situation, whether it's a beginner teachers, whether it's governors, whether it's senior leaders, whether it's curriculum leaders, I ask the question about who are the gatekeepers? Who are the people sat in the power seat, the decision making power and privilege? So thinking about who our gatekeepers are for flexible working is really, really important. And thinking about what training they've had around flexible working and around DEI. Because going back to the, the McKinsey report, in one of the, I can't remember if it's last year or the year before, it talks about the fact that even in institutions or in our context schools, where the head teacher, the chair of governors have agreed that we're going to enable flexible working in this school, how has that been trickled down, cascaded down to all of those different tiers of the school? Does that phase leader or that head of science understand the commitment the core commitment as a school to flexible working. Or when that person says to the line manager, I'm thinking about asking to work flexibly next year, do they receive the message, well, don't bother, it's not going to be accepted. Because that happens all the time. People get anecdotal feedback, anecdotal judgments, and then decide not to apply. And the head teacher, the chair of governance, doesn't even know that, that the second in science wanted to apply for flexible working. So I think how we do training for the different gatekeepers, particularly those who are line managers, team leaders, the people doing appraisal, is really, really important. And it might be an opportunity for you to deploy, for example, your HR team to come and do some training about the, the kind of organizational commitments of your school or of your trust. That's what we did when I was head in a, in a trust 28 schools. We had our HR person who came up on a half term cycle and ran HR training for SLT and the governors and, and anyone else who needed to be there. And we kept ourselves upskilled to make sure there was that collective pledge. And it was the SLT's responsibility to then cascade that training down to their respective line management um, members of staff. So have a think about that, please. Who are your gatekeepers and how are you consciously training them? Because we also, through all of this work, need to be challenging some of those biases that we know exist. OK, so the biases around whether or not people think that flexible working is OK or not. The messages that people give to each other. Well, I worked full time when I had two kids. Why can't you work full time when you've got two kids? That kind of that judgment that gets passed on um, and the perceptions that get perpetuated, I think, is something for us to really consider. So when we're thinking about unconscious bias training on a whole school level, how might we map that over and think about that in conjunction to flexible working and other people management policies that are in the building as well, so that we can then disrupt the fact that everyone who works flexibly doesn't belong to the same demographic group. 
So two questions for you to now think about and make some notes on. I want you to think about your pipeline. And when I mean pipeline, I mean your leadership pipeline in your school, from people who join you at entry level up to your senior leaders. Do you have any leaks in your pipeline? That leaky pipeline where you're potentially losing members of staff because they want flexible working opportunities. Either they've left your school to seek a flexible working opportunity, or they might have even left the sector because they wanted to work flexibly. But if you really wrap your brains over the last couple of years over exits, have you got any leaky pipelines? And equally, are there any blockages in your pipeline where there are visible or invisible barriers to those seeking flexible working? Let me give you a couple of minutes to reflect on those two questions and to gather your thoughts, please. Yes, Jackie, I completely agree. The misconceptions around the different types of flexible working as well. Not all flexible workers are part-time workers. It might be they have compressed hours or compacted hours, or they work a slightly different working pattern. That's a good point there, Jackie. Thank you. And if you're not sure how to answer these two questions, because you might not be privy to the information, where might you go and find that information? Who might you go and talk to? Who might hold some of the data here, formally or informally, um, around the pipeline? Is there anyone who would like to unmute and just share their reflections and take the question of Deborah? Thank you, Mike. Are you going to go? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's quite strange. Someone heard me through the window saying these things, but just what they're talking about. I don't have a leaky pipeline uh, necessarily, um, but I do think I have a blockage in the pipeline. Um, and that's something that's come across um, before. And it's, it, it's pretty visible because it's um, with some of our leadership. Uh, we changed our structure a number of years back and some of the staff were quite keen to have like team leaders or members or senior members of staff available through the day every day especially for more inexperienced teachers and, and, and that in a way has created this, this blockage because um, the perception from not necessarily from the senior leadership team but the perception from the rest of staff is they, 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 they like having a senior teacher in their team available all day to run mm. things off to talk through to get advice from and in a in primary school setting um, they really value that um, but that itself causes almost a block because the team leaders don't feel they can work as flexibly. Now, we do work flexibly with them. We do look at their PPA sessions, maybe on a Friday afternoon, Monday morning, for those who are travelling further, you know, various things we could do to support them. And we are looking at actually our, our, our structure now to see if we can change those roles a bit to allow more flexibility. flexibility. But that is, a, that is a blockage, I think, that people see, mm. I, you know, one member of staff, um, is currently off maternity. She's really keen to explore um, opportunities for her when she comes back, and I really want to explore those opportunities first. So I'm on a tight time scale to try to solve the conundrum. But it's not coming from the leadership team. We're we're happy to work basically. It's the it's the worry that's been raised by some of the more inexperienced teachers who really heavily rely and like having those people around them. That's really nice. interesting, Mike, because the perception could work both ways, can not it? But the perception could be that in this school, you can only be on SLT if you work full time. That might be how some people see it, even though that's not what's actually going on. But then equally, like you say, the perception that I feel safe when I have that senior leader in the building all the time, I feel supported. And I, 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 was, I was doing some work with a primary school um, in Solihull and they had um, two part-time workers. One was male, one was female. And when I was coaching the male who worked 0.6, and I was also then coaching the person whom I managed. It was really interesting because 
they have different perspectives on whether or not they should work the same days or not. Is it better if you both work part-time to both overlap, or is it better actually for the person who is the session plan to be the person who steps up on the day when he's not in, because actually there's then somebody then for other people to go to. So when we think about how we are developing our leadership pipelines, there might be an opportunity there to think about that kind of that shadow, that shadow leadership role, that actually it's an opportunity for people to step up on that day and fill and end I'm sure you've talked about that and thought about that already, Mike. How, how might that go down? That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the the actual role and in and and how we can share that role out um, <clears throat> amongst two staff and, and develop and give more succession planning and more opportunities for staff. So that, yeah. that's that's what we're looking at now. It is, it is a perception thing. And strangely, there are members of the leadership team who are not class based who are part time and they chose to mm. be that. So we kind of have this middle blockage in a way. <laughs> yeah, really interesting. And for those of you who are in secondary schools, it might be interesting to think about have you got particular subject teams where you've got a blockage because the head of maths, for example, doesn't do flexible working and no one in their team is allowed to work flexibly, whereas the head of English works flexibly, so everyone in the English team works flexibly. You can have sometimes those microcultures within a, within a school environment, even if the whole school is saying one thing, how might you disrupt some of those pockets as well? I can see there's quite a few um, things in the, in the chat. Let me just go to the chat for a second. Okay, so historical attitudes to navigate. Marcus, thank you for that. Absolutely. How do we um, dismantle this work change challenge? Um, because there's no point in asking because we're not going to do it. So that's that's an interesting legacy piece to disrupt. Absolutely, Andrea. How do we normalize this as a topic? So I, I coach a lot of women um, who are going for promotions who quite often ask me at what point in the application interview process do I ask for can work flexibly? And I think that's, that's an interesting conundrum in itself. If it's not been advertised as a flexible role, some of the advice is you wait till you get it off, get offered to you and then you negotiate. I personally put flexible working in every single advert. And the first question I would ask at interview was, do you want to work flexibly? So then we had it in consideration. So I think there's different ways to think about there about how we create space to visualize these conversations. Absolutely around good communication skills, thinking about how we train the communication skills. I was just on a call before this, running training on courageous conversations. How do we actually develop the skill set around line managers, team leaders, around communication, not only the talking, but also the listening and the what's not being said? I think that's really important. Thank you very much for that comment. Thinking about how we, yeah, helpful to the school's working patterns and needs. Yeah, really good comments in the chat here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hannah, I think Actually, that, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, I think that there's a really interesting discussion being had here around a number of different things, which is there could be a school or trust wide commitment to this work, but actually middle leaders have a different attitude to the leadership or vice versa. And mm -hmm. where, um, you know, um, where there might be um, misconceptions around how things have necessarily worked and therefore it becomes kind of folklore within, you know, organisations and things like that. And, you know, this, this is a really, um, really interesting debate that, 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 that's being had, you know, in, in, in the, the comments here. And I think that all of the things that are being said there are exactly the, the right things, which is, you know, mm -hmm. appraisers need to be able to support this. The whole school culture needs to send a clear message, hopefully, which we do now. I know that, you know, um, you know that 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 the flexible working is a possible and it's a priority and it's a you know um, an opportunity and and just to go to that last point um, so um, that, that I think there was a, a point that Kynwin had made there as well about um, the school's working patterns and needs actually through for example the work of Debbie um, you know who's here you know the the amazing work that has been able to happen because of flexibility that wouldn't have been able to have been uh -huh. you know, possible because of flexibility otherwise is testament to how it doesn't just need to be um, tolerated as you talked about before but an actual strategic choice to use yeah. flexibility to deliver your, the ambitions that you have for your team or for your school or you know trust or whatever so I think it's a really you know great conversation that's being had there and certainly happy to follow up with any of those yeah you know, brilliant on those points being made and actually we just as I was between the comments and as you were talking I was also just thinking about the kind of the visibility in the workplace around this and we know that there's a massive issue in a lot of schools around presenteeism and how those who are present are the ones who are seen to be working the hardest and who are the visible and they're the ones who then get promoted I think there's something to unpack there as well 
that people who work flexibly work as hard, it does work behind the scenes in their own hours at home. And how do we make sure we're creating that affirmation culture of seeing the value that's happening behind the scenes? So how have we got the advocacy through the line management and through other members of the team that they're not, it's not their day off, they are actually working flexibly in that time. You're nodding away, Antonio, has that come up before as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all kinds of misconceptions, and that's not just, you know, just through working with all of the flexible working ambassador schools and, you know, other people, you know, over the past year and, you know, year as part of this project. And I think there is a real case for the need for case studies. So where you can see case studies of men working flexibly, which I would say is probably something, you know, for us to be thinking about, you know, and the role models for, you know, men working flexible, flexibly within this, but also, you know, examples of how it's been used to benefit children, you know, because... Uh -huh. You know, um, one of the um, special schools that we've been working for it with, for example, they have um, um, they wanted the, their um, pre children, their AP children, to be able to work with um, professional or semi professional athletes. So that, but they need to train and they need to do their coaching and bits and pieces. But it provides for extracurricular, but it also provides for you know, so being able to get the right people around the table. So I think. The more case studies that we have of creative use of uh -huh. flexible working, the better attuned people will be to the possibilities of flexible working. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And for me, this feeds into our our whole school culture and ethos. And when, whenever I'm doing DEI work with schools, I always ask them to go back to what is the story that you are telling about your school? How do you frame who you are? What is your school's mission and vision statement? And what are your school values? And how can you make the link between your vision, mission and values and your DEI commitment? So when you're thinking about how you're framing your flexible working, how might you activate the things you're already saying and just get them to speak to and create a dialogue with your commitment to flexible working? To say, for example, I don't know, you've got the value um, of respect in your school, how do those values actually speak to the adult as well? That respect actually underpins flexible working, that we respect our colleagues to do their job in the hours they're given. So there's ways to perhaps um, articulate your commitment using your existing messaging, but just pulling out some of those golden threads um, as well. And ultimately, Dream, we're here tonight thinking about advocacy for approvers. And in order to normalize, usualize, make this visible, it's about us all leveraging our own spheres of influence. How are we um, so like talking up flexible working as individuals personally and professionally? How are we um, leveraging those um, interpersonal relationships and conversations where we are amplifying the positives and challenging some of the misconceptions? How does that then extend in the third ripple, the third circle, to the wider social institution, whether that's the, the school, the trust, the mat, whatever kind of institutional space we're thinking about here, how can we begin to chip away at some of that ingrained mindset, some of those traditional um, attitudes, some of that legacy that Mark has talked about, and how do we actually um, also influence that wider community piece? So I've, I follow lots of interesting threads on Twitter, and there's some interest, there's some interesting approaches that different schools are taking, where some schools give all of their parent teachers a morning to go and drop off or pick up their own children. And the letters they've written home to the school parents and carers is really speaking to the fact that you are parents and carers who want to drop your kids off, and our staff are parents and carers, and they want to drop their kids off as too. And just like being really quite candid about why it's an important part of the commitment that they want parents and carers to be able to do both, be a teacher for the children in front of them, but also look after their own children as well. There's a couple of stigmas or myths out there about the children might get upset if we have flexible workers, the children might get confused. Um, actually, like, where's the research that shows that? Where's, where's the verbatim testimonials from children? Most kids I know are quite capable of knowing two teachers' names and knowing the difference between those two teachers. And actually, it enriches their experience having two teachers in year five rather than one teacher. So I think there's things here that we can all take responsibility for, how we can just flex, leverage, expand our own spheres of influence, that rather than just thinking it or reading it, we're saying it and we're sharing it with our colleagues and peers as well. Um, 
Love that, Jackie. You've got a mission statement for students. Perhaps one for the staff would be a great idea. How you might um, extrapolate that to your staff would be brilliant. So I also talk about allyship or inclusive allyship a lot in my training about the fact that I don't work flexibly, but I've always been an ally for flexible workers. And that's what we're really being called um, forth to do through this work, that this is about us make, making our workplaces better for everybody, um, whether or not it impacts us directly or not. So the more he for she advocates we can get, talking about the positives of flexible working, the more women will be enabled to work flexibly. But equally, the more advocacy we have around the different identity groups and the more visible modeling we have of different people working flexibly, capturing those case studies that Antonia talked about, disrupting perhaps the stereotype that it is all white women and children who work flexibly. There's a, there's a narrative there for us to consider and a stereotype there for us to deconstruct as well. So how might we all be an ally for a potential flexible worker um, in the different meetings we sit in? When someone does say or do something that might be um, exclusionary, how might we challenge that and actually begin to chip away at some of those things? And ultimately, the other part of this work is thinking about how psychologically safe people feel within our school environment to even ask for flexible working. Is there a fear that if they ask for flexible working, they're going to be judged, that it's going to, it's going to perhaps discount them for opportunities in the future? I've heard that quite a lot, particularly from women returning from maternity leave or women who are thinking about their next step might be joining SLT. Um, is there an element of unsafety that people fear the judgment of working flexibly that we also need to call out and tackle as well? Because if we have, no worries, Deborah, thank you, lovely to meet you, thanks for joining us. Um, if, we, if we take create truly safe schools where people are equipped to have really courageous conversations, it means that people don't fear um, asking for what they need, and we might then not lose some of those staff through that leaky pipeline as well. And also, just going back to the psychological safety, I mean, if we know we have got some blockers in the building or some people who perhaps um, aren't massive advocates, we can train them and chip away at their mindset and attitude, but it might be that actually we need to think about the policy or the process of applying for, for um, flexible working and how we might disrupt some of those potential blockages um, as well. So notes for this section, I want you to think about, oh, is that the same question? Hang on, I've that question already, didn't I? Well, I think I've covered the same question. Okay, we'll bypass that question. That's the same question we've already had. Um, Antonia, how are we doing for time? Should I do this last section or not? Um, so, Hannah, we've got about 20 minutes until six o'clock. So, so whatever you think is the most... Okay, that's fine. I'm going to do this last three slides then. Okay, so um, just another um, kind of framework or strategy that might be a helpful one for you to lift and leverage for this. Um, that when we talk about DEI strategies and approaches um, in schools, we get people to think about the cultural intelligence framework, CQ. So we're all familiar with um, IQ and EQ, but CQ is an interesting lens to look at this work through. And cultural intelligence is ultimately a frame through which we look at the culture and the ethos of our organisation or our workplace. It primarily, primarily is looking at inter, intercultural working, but I think this is an interesting one for us to go back to the kind of the Simon Sinek, the golden circle, the, the cycle we need to go through on this work. And I'm just going to break it down for you to, to give some clarity here. So CQ drive, what is the driver for us understanding the culture of where we work? Like what is the driver for our flexible working commitment? How do we get under the skin of the culture of our workplace to perhaps um, challenge some of that deep-seated mindset and attitude around flexible working? So that's the first thing, the kind of the drive, the articulation, the commitment. Moving on to the right, the knowledge is then the information gathering. Are we operating on hunches or are we operation, operating on data? When we think about some of these perceptions around flexible working, how are we actually gathering them? So have we actually consulted the different stakeholder groups about how they might feel if we had more flexible workers in the school? I think sometimes we operate on what we think we know rather than actually understanding it. And some schools worry that they're going to upset their parents and their carers. 
by introducing flexible working. When they do, there's no worry at all. So I think the knowledge gathering phase is really interesting. Knowing how many staff are currently working flexibly who would like to work flexibly or who have left um, not because they can't work flexibly is also part of that knowledge gathering and part of the data piece. That then feeds into box three, bottom right, the strategy. Okay, what are the different things you're going to plan to do, prepare to do and deploy to actually enable for flexible working to happen? And it might be actually that part of your strategy is the training needed for those different gatekeepers. But what's the point of launching a flexible working approach and policy if your managers aren't actually trained or equipped to have those conversations and to consider that, if your timetabler isn't skilled up to actually do it? And then that leads into the action where you actually make it happen. So it might be that you're thinking about how, how can we retain some of our high caliber staff because they want to work flexibly, or it might be that you want to completely disrupt your recruitment cycle um, and start to recruit flexibly, because um, that might bring a different type of caliber of people in just by changing um, the advert. So that is the cultural intelligence cycle, which depending on where you sit in the hierarchy, might help you shape your strategy, or might be something you can take back to seniors to have a conversation about, this might be an interesting approach for us to take. Because those stakeholder perspectives um, are really, really important. Making sure that we are giving people the opportunity to share their, their thoughts and to give voice to things, which perhaps only happens to people who sit in particular circles. So if there was, for example, a focus group or a working party looking at flexible working, it's interesting how that group is formed and whether it's a, you nominate yourself or you're nominated to be in that space and how can we make sure that space is actually diverse as well. So thinking about those different stakeholder perspectives and people's different experiences of being the person who's working flexibly or the person who's line managing the person who's working flexibly or the student who's being taught by someone who works flexibly, that could be an interesting piece of this information gathering to gather those different perspectives so you, so you know from the horse's mouth what people are actually thinking and feeling. Because ultimately, by flexing our staff, we then encourage and recruit and retain more diverse individuals and we then develop and grow more diverse teams. And if you've not read um, Rebel Ideas by Matthew Saeed, it's not about flexible working, but it's about diversity in the workplace. Um, and it's about the benefits and the impact of having a diverse set of people around the table and how that then enhances the performance, productivity, and the levels of engagement because you've got diverse perspectives um, there represented. We're not in a group think situation where we've all got similar upbringing, similar lenses, similar biases, whenever we're doing any other activity um, actually in, in, that, in that team space as well. And that then feeds into the different sort of like elements of um, the cultural approaches throughout the school. So if we're going to truly lean into flexible working as part of our workforce um, kind of commitment, how does that then speak to that statement or that policy? How does it speak to all of those different processes and policies and practices across the whole school? How do you make sure that there's consistency and there's that golden thread? So when people work flexibly, how are you then flexible on their commitments, their deadlines, on, um, on things like their, their duties, on, on the expectations placed on them? I, was, I had somebody in a session yesterday at school in North London who worked 0.8, but she said she's paid 0.8, but the expectations of her are pretty much full time, even though she's not in the building one day a week. So how do we make sure that we bring that consideration, that mindfulness to those different aspects and we, and we consider the kind of the interconnectedness of all those different aspects of the school to ensure that we're not saying we're doing flexible working and then other policies and practices undermine that um, and perhaps create those, create those um, barriers for it. So your next set of notes, write down a couple of ideas around, have you already consulted different stakeholder groups or which stakeholder groups might you go about consulting? to actually get some um, verbatim feedback from different um, members of your school community on your potential um, or existing flexible working approach. Um, and what are the different perspectives you need to listen to, learn from champion challenge to enable flexible working to become fully embedded 
um, hard baked into um, how your school um, operates. I think let's give you a moment or two to think about those two questions, please. Is there anyone who'd like to share any stuff, any voice that have done already or any they're planning or any they're thinking about doing to gather that information? Uh, Hannah, Debbie, Debbie has gone to not leave you hanging, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I've been thinking about is that we've taken the approach with our flexible job design process, which is a type of flexibility, but not the statutory requests, um, not to ask people why they want to work flexibly and just assume that that's OK. And um, I've been reflecting on the comments that you um, said about, in particular, let's say Muslim colleagues who on a Friday, it might be that that is a particular reason why that particular moment might be more important. So how do we strike that balance between um, asking for reasons why people want to work flexibly and therefore trying to remove that stigma around having a hierarchy of reasons why it's OK at the same time as, you know, having that equity piece. So that's, um, yeah. you know, it's really, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because say, for example, you didn't ask for their reasons or you did, and then you made a decision based on someone's religion, are you then being unfair to the person? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting ethical kind of dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's what I've been thinking about in terms of different perspectives. Um, and going back to my dialogue with Mike, say, for example, you were in a faith school and everyone asking for flexible working, wanted to fight off because of their faith, you wouldn't be able to make that happen. So, so that that's yeah, that's it's an, it's an interesting one to think about. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on then. Um, so I'm conscious of the time. I don't want to keep people um sort of like late. So, I mean, there's two kind of like lenses for us to be aware of. Isn't there with flexible working? There's the, the mindset of the barriers and all the things that are wrong, could go wrong, could be problems. And how I work with the kind of deficit mindset and the barriers is. I'm very aware of them and I then counter them all. So that when I'm going into an interview or in a presentation or I'm trying to pitch something or propose something, if I can anticipate and mitigate all of the potential barriers and counter them, then that's something to perhaps think about. So it might be an interesting brainstorming activity to do with your team, with your senior leaders. Like, what are all the barriers to flexible working within our context? And then what are the possible potential solutions for us actually to remove those barriers? Because quite often those barriers are perhaps perceived rather than real. And in the TimeWise and Now Teach um, analysis report um, published last year around about two years ago, actually, barriers to um, flexible working. I just picked out the four there here that I think are quite interesting, quite pertinent. That one of the one of the um, cited barriers to flexible working is structural, and quite often um, it's the timetabling that's used as the as the excuse that we're not able to timetable that flexibility. That is that's a perceived barrier, not a real barrier. There's always ways. It might take a little bit longer to do the timetabling, but that is a perceived barrier, not a real barrier. Then there's the kind of the budget barrier that flexible working um, costs more because you're potentially having more on costs for different members of staff. Um, that's an interesting um, lens, but again, you can counter it 
that yes, it might cost more when you've got the staff in the building, but you might be saving more because you're not advertising as often um, and, you're, and, you're, and you're not doing the, the training of new members of staff as often. So there's an interesting just counter argument there. Um, read kind of the workload and the intensity um, of the school day. Um, that's an interesting one. Different schools have different policies around um, non-teaching contact time, PPA time. I think primary schools are much better at this than secondary, in my personal opinion, about uh, so like grouping PPA together and enabling staff to perhaps go site to their marking and stuff. I've only worked in one secondary school who are allowed to do that. Most of the secondary schools I've worked at, you were very much expected to be in the building for certain hours. Um, so thinking about um, the kind of the preparation to enable um, the work to happen and how we work our, um, I don't know, our meetings, our CPD, um, our moderation sessions, that if we're truly gonna lean into being a flexible workforce, we're gonna have to be flexible about some of those standing items in our working week as well, and how might we disrupt or dismantle some of them. And I do think the last two years have been interesting for that, that if we, we're so used to now having meetings virtually um, but do you need to be in the school building to access some of those things or is there some flex there about having that hybrid approach and using some of those virtuals and then the final one here is the one that's really like um key really for what we've been thinking about this afternoon but the cultural and attitudinal values um, of some of the ones we really need to be aware of the fear that if we let one person work flexibly everyone wants to work flexibly. The word fairness there that Mike um, brought up earlier on, the kind, of the, the kind of the concerns around, well, is that fair that they're doing that and I'm doing this? So there's some interesting things here just for us to be aware of. Um, and I'd recommend if you've not read it, the Time Wise Now Teach report on flexible working, um, an interesting piece of research because Now Teach specialise in career changes and, that, and the older um, teachers coming into the sector and quite often they've come from other sectors that are much more flexible than education. Um, so just an interesting um, dual, dual lens there on this piece of work. So ultimately, part of this work, and when we think about flexible working, and we think about the resistance and the adversity, and the obstacles we need to navigate, this is a part, this is a piece of change leadership or change management. Like with anything we do in a school, we, and we introduce a new initiative, we use all the change theory that we've picked up through our career, so going back to some of that change theory is something to consider. I quite often use um, the Kubler-Ross um, grief cycle when I'm talking about um, DEI, because we know that different people experience different emotions around change in different ways. Um, there's also the um, Rogers adoption curve about the fact that you have your early adopters, your innovators, your, your early majority, your late majority. So there's diff different people respond to flexible work in different ways. And how can we um, challenge mindsets? And how can we disrupt some of the fixed mindsets in the building? And how can we um, encourage that um, move towards a growth mindset and that focus on the positives and the benefits um, and, the, and the value, the richness that flexible working will bring to the school, to the team, to the children, as opposed to honing in on perhaps the things that are the perceived negatives. And there's a kind of a, a reframe there that's really needed and perhaps needs to be done in a very explicit way. And ultimately, the more um, champions and advocates we can develop and train and have as our kind of our people around the building, the more those different conversations will be disrupted. The DEI can't be led by one person in a school, and flexible working can't be led by one person in a school. Even if you started by perhaps training my managers or training the working party or training a, a certain number of people in the building who you know have reach and spheres of influence, that will help you cascade that commitment to make sure that your seniors aren't saying one thing and your juniors are saying something else. Okay, so I think thinking about that, developing the champions and the advocacy, the people who are the allies of flexible working in all of those different team spaces might be a, a good starting point, be that cultural change um, we need to see. So, last couple of notes here. What are the real barriers to flexible working in your context and how might you overcome them? And what are the perceived barriers? If we're going to break the barriers down into real and perceived, just grab a couple of notes there on what are some of the real barriers and what are some of the perceived barriers.
I'm just going to ask you to pop one for each category into the chat. Just put real an example and perceived an example. It'd be interested to see some of the reflections from, from the group um, in the chat, please. Yeah, some really good examples here coming through. Quite a lot of attitudinal ones for us to think about here. Practical and attitudinal, I'd say. Yes, yeah, so the time commitment is an interesting one as well, isn't it? Something that we've not talked about, but I'm just going to throw into the mix, comes up quite a lot for my network, is say, for example, um, you are a phase leader or a subject leader um, and you work part time. Um, so your con your contract might be 0.8, for example. Should your TLR then be reduced to 0.8, or should the TLR remain full? Because even on the day you're not in the building, you're still holding that role. It's an interesting one to think about that a lot of um, women in particular get shortchanged on their leadership responsibilities and um, remuneration because their leadership pay gets cut, even though they are still leading that subject on the day they're not in the building. Um, so have, have a think about that and what your policy is around um, kind of like salaries when it comes to flexible working um, as well. So through um, some of the reading and some of the research I've been doing, I've put together the kind of, this isn't necessarily a linear process, but I've put together some of the different things to consider when we're thinking about flexible working. I know you've covered some of these different um, aspects in some of the other sessions with uh, Maddie Coulter and Lindsay Patience and Lucy Rose and, and other kind of like speakers. But thinking about the different aspects we need to be aware of when it comes to flexible working, um, it's just something for us to begin to shape that policy, shape that practice. So really starting with the law, thinking about our HR policies and processes, and then thinking about our governance model being behind this and our leaders understanding why this is important, how it then feeds into the kind of the culture of the school, but how we're then communicating that and ensuring that it does pull through all those structures and systems. Thinking about the training needs of staff to enable this to happen, but also the timetabling um, needs. And how does that then impact on the budget? How does that impact on um, talent management, people management, and how does that impact on visible role models? Just some of the things you might want to consider as those jigsaw pieces. Um, around flexible working and I'll, I'll send Antonio a PDF of the slides to ping out to you if there's anything there you want to perhaps look at um, again in the future. So the final things before I wrap up is for us all just to think about how flexible working ultimately underpins and ensures that we are creating and working in inclusive workplaces and I think the irony sometimes of the school system is we're not as inclusive for the adults in the building as we are for the students and the pupils in the building. And what can we do differently to disrupt some of those things? And I, I put family friendly right there in the middle. So I do think one of the ironies of education is that sometimes at the expense of our own families, it's about serving the needs of other people's families. And I've heard some horror stories about people not being given flexibility that's really um, inhibited and prohibited um, that their family existence um, and they've had to make some big decisions. Also, the magnets on there just to really um, emphasize the idea of recruitment, retention, and re engagement. Thinking about how you're positioning adverts, does it always need to be um, for an NQT, ECT, or could it be for a returning teacher? And how might you re engage um, some of those people who are qualified down the road 
who might come in and do, add, add loads of um, loads of um, value to your school, um, who perhaps will apply for that job because they don't think it's including them. And ultimately, we need to be thinking about the desired impact of working flexibly and creating work um, flexible um, workplaces. So what impact can we gather from our own ex um, experience of it already? What impact can you share across this group? And how might some of those cases that Antonia talked about perhaps help you leverage flexible working in the future, particularly when you are trying to influence those naysayers and challenge those mindsets? If they've got something to read and they've got some impact to, to see, that might actually just be what they need sometimes to, ch to change some of those perceptions as well. And we also need to think about that alongside the kind of the, the impact, the risks if we don't do flexible working, if we don't flex our workforce. There's obviously risks if we do do it, but there's also risks if we don't do it. And we, we do love a risk register in education. Um, thinking about how we mitigate for those risks, we anticipate those risks, and we consider if we don't create a flexible culture workplace, who and what might we lose, what might be the detrimental impact of that, um, have that in mind as well as, as part of the narrative and part of the commitment. So I'm going to leave you with these final two questions. How can a more inclusive workplace positively impact your staff team or your school? And what are the risks to your staffing model if you are not flexible advocates? I must have been typing fast, a couple of typos on there. That's the last two couple of questions for you to think about. And I'm gonna hand back over to Antonia. Thank you very, very much, Hannah. Um, I think that if, um, if people saw flexible working before as something that was a kind of HR decision or some, you know, I think we've kind of, you rather have debugged some of that today. I think, you know, all of your discussions around diversity, equality and inclusion and flexible working, I think makes it an imperative rather than a nice have, um, you know, within organisations. So thank you very, very much. There's been so many positive comments, um, you know, for for, for today's presentation we're going to share it more widely and um, people have asked for the slides as well Hannah so if you're yeah, okay with me that's fine I'll, I'll send you the slides over because you've got some referencing at the back here in our DEI directory there's a number of organizations here for you to be aware of supporting this work and we've got a toolkit of things to listen to watch and read around flexible working so I'll send all this over to Antonio what's I've removed my typos from my deck um, and then you've got that there as a reference point um, for your for yourself and your colleagues as well Thank you so much, Hannah. It's been a brilliant session. Thank you so, so much. Cheers. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Lovely to meet you. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming along. Thank See you, you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.